Chapter 4 I can hardly describe the mood in which I was left by this harrowing episode, an episode at once mad and pitiful, grotesque and terrifying. The grocery boy had prepared me for it, yet the reality left me none the less bewildered and disturbed. Puerile though the story was, old Zadok's insane earnestness and horror had communicated to me a mounting unrest which joined with my earlier sense of loathing for the town and its blight of intangible shadow. Later I might sift the tale and extract some nucleus of historic allegory. Just now I wish to put it out of my head. The hour had grown perilously late. My watch said 7.15, and the Arkham bus left town square at 8. So I tried to give my thoughts as neutral and practical a cast as possible, meanwhile walking rapidly through the deserted streets of gaping roofs and leading houses toward the hotel where I had checked my valise and would find my bus. Though the golden light of late afternoon gave the ancient roofs and decrepit chimneys an air of mystic loveliness and peace, I could not help glancing over my shoulder now and then. I would surely be very glad to get out of malodorous and fear-shadowed Innsmouth, and wished there were some other vehicle than the bus driven by that sinister-looking fellow sergeant. Yet I did not hurry too precipitately, for there were architectural details worth viewing at every silent corner, and I could, easily, I calculated, cover the necessary distance in a half hour. Studying the grocery youth's map and seeking a route I had not traversed before, I chose Marsh Street instead of State for my approach to Town Square. Near the corner of Fall Street I began to see scattered groups of furtive whisperers, and when I finally reached the square I saw that almost all the loiterers were congregated around the door of the Gilman House. It seemed as if many bulging, watery, unwinking eyes looked oddly at me as I claimed my valise in the lobby, and I hoped that none of these unpleasant creatures would be my fellow passengers on the coach. The bus, rather early, rattled in with three passengers somewhat before eight, and an evil-looking fellow on the sidewalk muttered a few indistinguishable words to the driver. Sergeant threw out a mail bag and a roll of newspapers, and entered the hotel while the passengers, the same men whom I had seen arriving in Newburyport that morning, shambled to the sidewalk and exchanged some faint guttural words with a loafer in a language I could have sworn was not English. I boarded the empty coach and took the same seat I had taken before, but was hardly settled before Sergeant reappeared and began mumbling in a throaty voice of peculiar repulsiveness. I was, it appeared, in very bad luck. There had been something wrong with the engine, despite the excellent time made from Newburyport, and the bus could not complete the journey to Arkham. No, it could not possibly be repaired that night, nor was there any other way of getting transportation out of Innsmouth, either to Arkham or elsewhere. Sergeant was sorry, but I would have to stop over at the Gilman. Probably the clerk would make the price easy for me, but there was nothing else to do. Almost dazed by this sudden obstacle, and violently dreading the fall of night in this decaying and half-unlighted town, I left the bus and re-entered the hotel lobby, where the sullen, queer-looking night clerk told me I could have room 428 on next to the top floor, large but without running water, for a dollar. Despite what I had heard of this hotel at Newburyport, I signed the register, paid my dollar, let the clerk take my valise, and followed that stout, solitary attendant up three creaking flights of stairs past dusty corridors which seemed wholly devoid of life. My room, a dismal rear one with two windows and bare, cheap furnishings, overlooked a dingy courtyard otherwise hemmed in by low, deserted brick blocks, and commanded a view of decrepit westward-stretching roofs with a marshy countryside beyond. At the end of the corridor was a bathroom, a discouraging relic with ancient marble bowl, tin tub, faint electric light, and musty wooden paneling around all the plumbing fixtures. It being still daylight, I descended to the square and looked around for a dinner of some sort, noticing as I did so the strange glances I received from the unwholesome loafers. Since the grocery was closed, I was forced to patronize the restaurant I had shunned before, a stooped narrow-headed man with staring, unwinking eyes, and a flat-nosed wench with unbelievably thick, clumsy hands, being in attendance. The service was all of the counter-type, 
and it relieved me to find that much was evidently served from cans and packages. A bowl of vegetable soup with crackers was enough for me, and I soon headed back for my cheerless room at the Gilman, getting an evening paper and a fly-specked magazine from the evil-visaged clerk at the rickety stand beside the desk. As twilight deepened, I turned on the one feeble electric bulb over the cheap iron frame bed and tried as best I could to continue the reading I had begun. I felt it advisable to keep my mind wholesomely occupied, for it would not do to brood over the abnormalities of this ancient, blight-shadowed town while I was still within its borders. The insane yarn I had heard from the aged drunkard did not promise very pleasant dreams, and I felt I must keep the image of his wild, watery eyes as far as possible from my imagination. Also, I must not dwell on what that factory inspector had told the Newburyport ticket agent about the Gilman house and the voices of its nocturnal tenants. Not on that, nor on the face beneath the tiara and the black church doorway, the face for whose horror my conscious mind could not account. It would perhaps have been easier to keep my thoughts from disturbing topics had the room not been so gruesomely musty. As it was, the lethal mustiness blended hideously with the town's general fishy odor and persistently focused one's fancy on death and decay. Another thing that disturbed me was the absence of a bolt on the door of my room. One had been there, as marks clearly shewed, but there were signs of recent removal. No doubt it had become out of order, like so many other things in this decrepit edifice. In my nervousness I looked around and discovered a bolt on the clothes press, which seemed to be of the same size, judging from the marks, as the one formerly on the door. To gain a partial relief from the general tension, I busied myself by transferring this hardware to the vacant place with the aid of a handy three-in-one device, including a screwdriver, which I kept on my key ring. The bolt fitted perfectly, and I was somewhat relieved when I knew that I could shoot it firmly upon retiring. Not that I had any real apprehension of its need, but that any symbol of security was welcome in an environment of this kind. There were adequate bolts on the two lateral doors to connecting rooms, and these I proceeded to fasten. I did not undress, but decided to read till I was sleepy and then lie down with only my coat, collar, and shoes off. Taking a pocket flashlight from my valise, I placed it in my trousers so that I could reach my watch if I woke up later in the dark. Drowsiness, however, did not come, and when I stopped to analyze my thoughts, I found to my disquiet that I was really unconsciously listening for something. Listening for something which I dreaded but could not name. That inspector's story must have worked on my imagination more deeply than I had suspected. Again I tried to read, but found that I made no progress. After a time, I seemed to hear the stairs and corridors creak at intervals, as if with footsteps, and wondered if the other rooms were beginning to fill up. There were no voices, however, and it struck me that there was something subtly furtive about the creaking. I did not like it, and debated whether I had better try to sleep at all. This town had some queer people, and there had undoubtedly been several disappearances. Was this one of those inns where travelers were slain for their money? Surely I had no look of excessive prosperity. Or were the townsfolk really so resentful about curious visitors? Had my obvious sightseeing with its frequent map consultations aroused unfavorable notice? It occurred to me that I must be in a highly nervous state to let a few random creakings set me off speculating in this fashion. But I regretted nonetheless that I was unarmed. At length, Feeling a fatigue which had nothing of drowsiness in it, I bolted the newly outfitted hall door, turned off the light, and threw myself down on the hard, uneven bed, coat, collar, shoes, and all. In the darkness every faint noise of the night seemed magnified, and a flood of doubly unpleasant thoughts swept over me. I was sorry I'd put out the light. It was too tired to rise and turn it on again. Then, after a long, dreary interval, and prefaced by a fresh creaking of stairs and corridors. There came that soft, damnably unmistakable sound which seemed like a malign fulfillment of all my apprehensions. Without the least shadow of a doubt, the lock on my hall door was being tried, cautiously, furtively, 
tentatively with a key. My sensations upon recognizing the sign of actual peril were perhaps less rather than more tumultuous because of my previous vague fears. I had been, albeit without de definite reason, instinctively on my guard, and that was to my advantage in the new and real crisis, whatever it might turn out to be. Nevertheless, the change in the menace from vague premonition to immediate reality was a profound shock and fell upon me with the force of a genuine blow. It never once occurred to me that the fumbling might be a mere mistake. Malign purpose was all I could think of, and I kept deathly quiet, awaiting the would-be intruder's next move. After a time, the cautious rattling ceased, and I heard the room to the north entered with a passkey. Then the lock of the connecting door to my room was softly tried, the bolt held, of course, and I heard the floor creak as the prowler left the room. After a moment there came another soft rattling, and I knew that the room to the south of me was being entered. Again a furtive trying of a bolted connecting door, and again a receding creaking. This time the creaking went along the hall and down the stairs, so I knew that the prowler had realized the bolted condition of my doors, and was giving up his attempt for a greater or lesser time as the future would shew. The readiness with which I fell into a plan of action proves that I must have been subconsciously fearing some menace and considering possible avenues of escape for hours. From the first I felt that the unseen fumbler meant a danger not to be met or dealt with, but only to be fled from as precipitately as possible. The one thing to do was to get out of that hotel alive as quickly as I could, and through some channel other than the front stairs and lobby. Rising softly, throwing my flashlight on the switch, I sought to light the bulb over my bed in order to choose and pocket some belongings for a swift, releaseless flight. Nothing, however, happened, and I saw that the power had been cut off. Clearly some cryptic, evil movement was afoot on a large scale, just what I could not say. As I stood pondering with my hand on the now useless switch, I heard a muffled creaking on the floor below, and thought I could barely distinguish voices in conversation. A moment later I felt less sure that the deeper sounds were voices, since the apparent hoarse barkings and loose-syllabled croakings bore so little resemblance to recognized human speech. Then I thought with renewed force of what the factory inspector had heard in the night in this moldering and pestilential building. Having filled my pockets with the flashlight's aid, I put on my hat and tiptoed to the windows to consider chances of descent. Despite the state's safety regulations, there was no fire escape on this side of the hotel, and I saw that my windows commanded only a sheer three-story drop to the cobbled courtyard. On the right and left, however, some ancient brick business blocks abutted on the hotel, their slant roofs coming up to a reasonable jumping distance from my fourth-story level. To reach either of these lines of buildings, I would have to be in a room two doors from my own, in one case on the north and in the other case on the south, and my mind instantly set to work calculating what chances I had of making the transfer. I could not, I decided, risk an emergence into the corridor, where my footsteps would surely be heard, and where the difficulties of entering the desired room would be insuperable. My progress, if it was to be made at all, would have to be through the less solidly built connecting doors of the rooms, the locks and bolts of which I would have to force violently, using my shoulder as a battering ram whenever they were set against me. This, I thought, would be possible owing to the rickety nature of the house and its fixtures, but I realized I could not do it noiselessly. I would have to count on sheer speed, and the chance of getting to a window before any hostile forces became coordinated enough to open the right door toward me with a passkey. My own outer door I reinforced by pushing the bureau against it, little by little, in order to make a minimum of sound. I perceived that my chances were very slender, and was fully prepared for any calamity. Even getting to another roof would not solve the problem, for there would then remain the task of reaching the ground and escaping from the town. 
One thing in my favor was the deserted and ruinous state of the budding buildings, and the number of skylights gaping blackly open in each row. Gathering from the grocery boy's map that the best route out of town was southward, I glanced first at the connecting door on the south side of the room. It was designed to open in my direction. Hence, I saw, after drawing the bolt and finding other fastenings in place, it was not a favorable one for forcing. Accordingly, abandoning it as a route, I cautiously moved the bedstead against it to hamper any attack which might be made on it later from the next room. The door on the north was hung to open away from me, and this, though a test proved it to be locked or bolted from the other side, I knew must be my route. If I could gain the roofs of the buildings in Payne Street and descend successfully to the ground level, I might perhaps dart through the courtyard of the adjacent or opposite buildings to Washington or Bates, or else emerge in pain and edge around southward into Washington. In any case, I would aim to strike Washington and somehow and get quickly out of the town square region. My preference would be to avoid pain, since the fire station there might be open all night. As I thought of these things, I looked out over the squalid sea of decaying roofs below me, now brightened by the beams of a moon not much past full. On the right, the black gash of the river gorge clove the panorama, abandoned factories and railway station clinging barnacle-like to its sides. Beyond it, the rusted railway and the rowley road led off through the flat, marshy terrain, dotted with islets of higher and drier scrub-grown land. On the left, the creek-threaded countryside was nearer, the narrow road to Ipswich gleaming white in the moonlight. I could not see from my side of the hotel the southward route toward Arkham, which I had determined to take. I was irresolutely speculating on when I had better tack the northern door, and on how I could least audibly manage it, when I noticed that the vague noises underfoot had given place to a fresh and heavier creaking of the stairs. A wavering flicker of light shooed through my transom, and the boards of the corridor began to groan with a ponderous load. Muffled sounds of possible vocal origin approached, and at length... A firm knock came at my outer door. For a moment, I simply held my breath and waited. Eternity seemed to elapse, and the nauseous, fishy odor of my environment seemed to mount suddenly and spectacularly. Then the knocking was repeated, continuously and with growing insistence. I knew that the time for action had come, and forthwith drew the bolt of the northward connecting door, bracing myself for the task of battering it open. The knocking waxed louder, and I hoped that its volume would cover the sound of my efforts. At last, beginning my attempt, I lunged again and again at the thin paneling with my left shoulder, heedless of shock or pain. The door resisted even more than I had expected, but I did not give in, and all the while the clamor at the outer door increased. Finally, the connecting door gave, but with such a crash that I knew those outside must have heard. Instantly, the outside knocking became a violent battering, while keys sounded ominously in the hall doors of the rooms on both sides of me. Rushing through the newly opened connection, I succeeded in bolting the northerly hall door before the lock could be turned, but even as I did so, I heard the hall door of the third room, the one from whose window I had hoped to reach the roof below, being tried with a passkey. For an instant, I felt absolute despair, since my trapping in a chamber with no window egress seemed complete. A wave of almost abnormal horror swept over me, and invested with a terrible but unexplainable singularity, the flashlight glimpsed dust prints made by the intruder who had lately tried my door from this room. Then, with a dazed automatism which persisted despite hopelessness, I made for the next connecting door and performed the blind motion of pushing at it in an effort to get through, and... Granting that fastenings might be as providentially intact as in this second room, bolt the hall door beyond before the lock be turned from outside. Sheer fortunate chance gave me my reprieve, for the connecting door before me was not only unlocked, but actually ajar. In a second I was through and had my right knee and shoulder against a hall door which was visibly opening inward. My pressure took the opener off guard, for the thing shut as I pushed, so that I could slip the well-conditioned bolt as I had done with the other door. As I gained this respite, I heard the battering at the two other doors abate, while a confused clatter came from the connecting door I had shielded with the bedstead. 
Evidently the bulk of my assailants had entered the southerly room and were massing in a lateral attack, but at the same moment a passkey sounded at the next door to the north, and I knew that a nearer peril was at hand. The northward connecting door was wide open, but there was no time to think about checking the already turning lock in the hall. All I could do was to shut and bolt the open connecting door, as well as its mate on the opposite side, pushing a bedstead against the one and a bureau against the other, and moving a washstand in front of the hall door. I must, I saw, trust to such makeshift barriers to shield me till I could get out the window and on the roof of the Payne Street lock, but even in this acute moment my chief horror was something apart from the immediate weakness of my defenses. I was shuddering because not one of my pursuers, despite some hideous pantings, gruntings, and subdued barkings at odd intervals, was uttering an unmuffled or intelligible vocal sound. As I moved the furniture and rushed toward the windows, I heard a frightful scurrying along the corridor toward the room north of me, and perceived that the southward battering had ceased. Plainly, most of my opponents were about to concentrate against the terrible connecting door which they knew must open directly on me. Outside, the moon played on the ridgepole of the dock below, and I saw that the jump would be desperately hazardous because of the steep surface on which I must land. Surveying the conditions, I chose the more southerly of the two windows as my avenue of escape, planning to land on the inner slope of the roof and make for the nearest skylight. Once inside one of the decrepit brick structures, I would have to reckon with pursuit, but I hoped to descend and dodge in and out of yawning doorways along the shadowed courtyard, eventually getting to Washington Street and slipping out of town toward the south. The clatter at the northerly connecting door was now terrific, and I saw that the weak paneling was beginning to splinter. Obviously the besiegers had brought some ponderous object into play as a battering ram. The bedstead, however, still held firm, so that I had at least a faint chance of making good my escape. As I opened the window, I noticed that it was flanked by heavy velour drapery suspended from a pole by brass rings, and also that there was a large projecting catch for the shutters on the exterior. Seeing a possible means of avoiding the dangerous jump, I yanked at the hangings and brought them down, pole at all, then quickly hooking two of the rings in the shutter catch and flinging the drapery outside. The heavy folds reached fully to the abutting roof, and I saw that the rings and catch would be likely to bear my weight, so climbing out of the window and down the improvised rope ladder, I left behind me forever the morbid and horror-infested fabric of the Gilman House. I landed safely on the loose slates of the steep roof, and succeeded in gaining the gaping black skylight without a slip. Glancing up at the window I had left, I observed that it was still dark, though far across the crumbling chimneys to the north I could see lights ominously blazing in the order of Dagon Hall, the Baptist Church, and the Congregational Church which I recalled so shiveringly. There had seemed to be no one in the courtyard below, and I hoped that there would be a chance to get away before the spreading of a general alarm. Flashing my pocket lamp into the skylight, I saw that there were no steps down. The distance was slight, however, so I clambered over the brink and dropped, striking a dusty floor littered with crumbling boxes and barrels. The place was ghoulish-looking, but I was past minding such impressions, and made at once for the staircase revealed by my flashlight. After a hasty glance at my watch, which shewed the hour to be 2 a.m., the steps creaked that seemed tolerably sound, and I raced down past a barn-like second story to the ground floor. The desolation was complete, and only echoes answered my footfalls. At length I reached the lower hall, at one end of which I saw a faint luminous rectangle marking the ruined Payne Street doorway. Heading the other way, I found the back door also open, and darted out and down five stone steps to the grass-grown cobblestones of the courtyard. The moonbeams did not reach down here, but I could just see my way about without using the flashlight. Some of the windows on the Gilman House side were faintly glowing, and I thought I heard confused sounds within. Walking softly over to the Washington Street side, I perceived several open doorways and chose the nearest as my route out. The hallway inside was black, and when I reached the opposite end, I saw that the street door was wedged immovably shut. Resolved to try another building, I groped my way back toward the courtyard, but stopped short when close to the doorway, for out of an open door in the Gilman House a large crowd of doubtful shapes was pursuing. 
lanterns bobbing in the darkness, and horrible croaking voices exchanging low cries in what was certainly not English. The figures moved uncertainly, and I realized to my relief that they did not know where I had gone, but for all that they sent a shiver of horror through my frame. Their features were indistinguishable, but their crouching, shambling gait was abominably repellent. And worst of all, I perceived that one figure was strangely robed and unmistakably surmounted by a tall tiara of a design altogether too familiar. As the figure spread throughout the courtyard, I felt my fears increase. Suppose I could find no egress from this building on the street side. The fishy odor was detestable, and I wondered I could stand it without fainting. Again, groping toward the street, I opened a door off the hall and came upon an empty room with closely shuttered but sashless windows. Fumbling in the rays of my flashlight, I found I could open the shutters, and in another moment had climbed outside and was carefully closing the aperture in its original manner. I was now in Washington Street, and for the moment saw no living thing nor any light save that of the moon. From several directions in the distance, however, I could hear the sound of hoarse voices, of footsteps, and of a curious kind of pattering which did not sound quite like footsteps. Plainly, I had no time to lose. The points of the compass were clear to me, and I was glad that all the streetlights were turned off, as is often the custom on strongly moonlit nights in unprosperous rural regions. Some of the sounds came from the south, yet I retained my design of escaping in that direction. There would, I knew, be plenty of deserted doorways to shelter me in case I met any person or group who looked like pursuers. I walked rapidly, softly, and close to the ruined houses. While hatless and disheveled after my heart was climb, I did not look especially noticeable, and stood a good chance of passing unheeded if forced to encounter any casual wayfarer. At Bates Street I drew into a yawning vestibule while two shambling figures crossed in front of me, but was soon on my way again and approaching the open space where Elliott Street obliquely crosses Washington at the intersection of South. Though I had never seen this place, it had looked dangerous to me on the grocery use map since the moonlight would have free play there. There was no use trying to evade it, for any alternative course would involve detours of possibly disastrous visibility and delaying effect. The only thing to do was to cross it boldly and openly, imitating the typical shamble of the Innsmouth folk as best I could, and trusting that no one, or at least no pursuer of mine, would be there. Just how fully the pursuit was organized, and indeed just what its purpose might be, I could form no idea. There seemed to be unusual activity in the town, but I judged that the news of my escape from the Gilman had not yet spread. I would, of course, soon have to shift from Washington to some other southward street, for that party from the hotel would doubtless be after me. I must have left dust prints in that last old building, revealing how I had gained the street. The open space was, as I had expected, strongly moonlit and I saw the remains of a park-like, iron-railed green in its center. Fortunately, no one was about, though a curious sort of buzz or roar seemed to be increasing in the direction of the town square. South Street was very wide, leading directly down a slight declivity to the waterfront and commanding a long view out at sea, and I hoped that no one would be glancing up at it from afar as I crossed in the bright moonlight. My progress was unimpeded, and no fresh sound arose to hint that I had been spied. Glancing about me, I involuntarily let my pace slacken for a second to take in the sight of the sea, gorgeous in the burning moonlight at the street's end. Far out beyond the breakwater was the dim, dark line of Devil Reef, and as I glimpsed it, I could not help thinking of all the hideous legends I had heard in the last thirty-four hours legends which portrayed this ragged rock as a veritable gateway to realms of unfathomed horror and inconceivable abnormality. Then, without warning, I saw the intermittent flashes of light on the distant reef. They were definite and unmistakable, and awaked in my mind a blind horror beyond all rational proportion. My muscles tightened for panic flight, 
held in only by a certain unconscious caution and half-hypnotic fascination. And to make matters worse, there now flashed forth from the lofty couple of the Gilman House, which loomed up to the northeast behind me, a series of analogous, those differently spaced gleams, which could be nothing less than an answering signal. Controlling my muscles and realizing how fresh how plainly visible I was, I resumed my brisker and faintedly shambling pace, though keeping my eyes on that hellish and ominous reef as long as the opening of South Street gave me a seaward view. What the whole proceeding meant I could not imagine, unless it involved some strange rite connected with Devil Reef, or unless some party had landed from a ship on that sinister rock. I now bent to the left around the ruinous green, still gazing toward the ocean as it blazed in the spectral summer moonlight, and watching the cryptical flashing of those nameless, unexplainable beacons. It was then that the most horrible impression of all was borne in upon me, the impression which destroyed my last vestige of self-control and sent me running frantically southward past the yawning black doorways and fishly staring windows of the deserted Nightmare Street, for at a closer glance I saw that the moonlit waters between the reef and the shore were far from empty. They were alive with a teeming horde of shapes swimming inward toward the town, and even at my vast distance and in my single moment of perception, I could tell that the bobbing heads and flailing arms were alien and aberrant in a way scarcely to be expressed or consciously formulated. My frantic running ceased before I had covered a block, for at my left I began to hear something like the hue and cry of organized pursuit. There were footsteps and guttural sounds, and a rattling motor wheezed south along Federal Street. In a second all my plans were utterly changed, for if the southward highway were blocked ahead of me, I must clearly find another egress from Inmouth. I paused and drew into a gaping doorway, reflecting how lucky I was to have left the moonlit open space before these pursuers came down the parallel street. A second reflection was less comforting. Since the pursuit was down another street, it was plain that the party was not following me directly. It had not seen me, but was simply obeying a general plan of cutting off my escape. This, however, implied that all roads leading out of Innsmouth were similarly patrolled, where the denizens could not have known what route I intended to take. If this were so, I would have to make my retreat across country away from any road, but how could I do that in view of the marshy and creek-riddled nature of all the surrounding region? For a moment my brain reeled, both from sheer hopelessness and from a rapid increase in the omnipresent fishy odor. Then I thought of the abandoned railway to Rowley, whose solid line of ballasted weed-grown earth still stretched off to the northwest from the crumbling station on the edge of the river gorge. There was just a chance that the townsfolk would not think of that, since its briar-choked desertion made it half impassable and the unlikeliest of all avenues for a fugitive to choose. I had seen it clearly from my hotel window and knew about how it lay. Most of its earlier length was uncomfortably visible from the Rowley Road and from high places in the town itself, but one could perhaps crawl inconspicuously through the undergrowth. At any rate, it would form my only chance of deliverance, and there was nothing to do but to try it. Drawing inside the hall of my deserted shelter, I once more consulted the grocery boy's map with the aid of the flashlight. The immediate problem was how to reach the ancient railway, and I now saw that the safest course was ahead to Babson Street, then west to Lafayette, and there edging around, but not crossing an open space homologous to the one I had traversed, and subsequently back northward and westward in a zigzagging line through Lafayette, Bates, Adams, and Bank Streets, the latter skirting the river gorge, to the abandoned and dilapidated station I had seen from my window. My reason for going ahead to Babson was that I wished neither to recross the earlier open space, nor to begin my westward course along a cross street as broad as south. Starting once more, I crossed the street to the right-hand side in order to edge around into Babson as inconspicuously as possible. Noises still continued in Federal Street, and as I glanced behind me I thought I saw a gleam of light near the building through which I had escaped. Anxious to leave Washington Street, I broke into a quiet dog-trot, trusting to luck not to encounter any observing eye. 
Next, the corner of Babson Street, I saw to my alarm that one of the houses was still inhabited, as attested by curtains at the window. But there were no lights within, and I passed it without disaster. In Babson Street, which crossed Federal and might thus reveal me to the searchers, I clung as closely as possible to the sagging, uneven buildings, twice pausing in a doorway as the noises behind me momentarily increased. The open space ahead shone wide and desolate under the moon, but my route would not force me to cross it. During my second pause I began to detect a fresh distribution of vague sounds, and upon looking cautiously out from cover beheld a motor car darting across the open space, bound outward along Elliott Street, which there intersects both Babson and Lafayette. As I watched, choked by a sudden rise in the fishy odor after a short abatement, I saw a band of uncouth, crouching shapes loping and shambling in the same direction, and knew that this must be the party guarding the Ipswich Road, since that highway forms an extension of Elliott Street. Two of the figures I glimpsed were in voluminous robes, and one wore a peaked diadem which glistened whitely in the moonlight. The gait of this figure was so odd that it sent a chill through me, for it seemed to me the creature was almost hopping. When the last of the band was out of sight, I resumed my progress, darting around the corner to Lafayette Street, and crossing Elliot very hurriedly, lest stragglers of the party be still advancing along that thoroughfare. I did hear some croaking and clattering sounds far off toward Town Square, but accomplished the passage without disaster. My greatest dread was in recrossing broad and moonlit South Street, with its seaward view, and I had to nerve myself for the ordeal. Someone might easily be looking, and possible Elliot Street stragglers could not fail to glimpse me from either of two points. At the last moment I decided I had better slacken my trot and make the crossing as before, in the shambling gait of an average Innsmouth native. When the view of the water again opened out, this time on my right, I was half determined not to look at it at all. I could not, however, resist, but cast a sidelong glance as I carefully and imitatively shambled toward the protecting shadows ahead. There was no ship visible, as I had half expected there would be. Instead, the first thing which caught my eye was a small rowboat pulling in toward the abandoned wharves and laden with some bulky tarpaulin-covered object. Its rowers, though distantly and indistinctly seen, were of an especially repellent aspect. Several swimmers were still discernible, while on the far black reef I could see a faint steady glow, unlike the winking beacon visible before, and of a curious color which I could not precisely identify. Above the slant roofs ahead and to the right there loomed the tall couple of the Gilman House, but it was completely dark. The fishy odor, dispelled from a moment by some merciful breeze, now closed in again with maddening intensity. I had not quite crossed the street when I heard a muttering band advancing along Washington from the south. As they reached the broad open space where I had had my first disquieting glimpse of the moonlit water, I could see them plainly, only a block away, and was horrified by the bestial abnormality of their faces and the dog-like subhumanness of their crouching gait. One man moved in a positively simian way, with long arms frequently touching the ground, while another figure, robed and tiaraed, seemed to progress in an almost hopping fashion. I judged this party to be the one I had seen in the Gilman's courtyard, the one therefore most closely on my trail. As some of the figures turned to look in my direction, I was transfixed with fright, yet managed to preserve the casual, shambling gait I had assumed. To this day I do not know whether they saw me or not. If they did, my stratagem must have deceived them, for they passed on across the moonlit space without varying their course. Meanwhile, croaking and jabbering in some hateful guttural patois I could not identify. Once more in shadow, I resumed my former dog trot past the leaning and decrepit houses that stared blankly into the night. Having crossed the western sidewalk, I rounded the nearest corner into Bates Street, where I kept close to the buildings on the southern side. I passed two houses shooing signs of habitation, one of which had faint lights in upper rooms, yet met with no obstacle. As I turned into Adams Street, I felt measurably safer, but received a shock when a man reeled out of a black doorway directly in front of me. He proved, however, 
too hopelessly drunk to be a menace, so that I reached the dismal ruins of the Bank Street warehouses in safety. No one was stirring in that dead street beside the river gorge, and the roar of the waterfalls quite drowned my footsteps. It was a long dog trot to the ruined station, and the great brick warehouse walls all around me seemed somehow more terrifying than the fronts of private houses. At last, I saw the ancient arcaded station, or what was left of it, and made directly for the tracks that started from its farther end. The rails were rusty but mainly intact, and not more than half the ties had rotted away. Walking or running on such a surface was very difficult, but I did my best, and on the whole made very fair time. For some distance the line kept on along the gorge's brink, but at length I reached the long covered bridge where it crossed the chasm at a dizzy height. The condition of this bridge would determine my next step. If humanly possible, I would use it. If not, I would have to risk more street wandering and take the nearest intact highway bridge. The vast, barn-like length of the old bridge gleamed spectrally in the moonlight, and I saw that the ties were safe for at least a few feet within. Entering, I began to use my flashlight, and was almost knocked down by the cloud of bats that flapped past me. About halfway across, there was a perilous gap in the ties, which I feared for a moment would halt me. But in the end, I risked a desperate jump, which fortunately succeeded. I was glad to see the moonlight again when I emerged from that macabre tunnel. The old tracks crossed River Street at grade, and at once veered off into a region increasingly rural and with less and less of Innsmouth abhorrent fishy odor. Here the dense growth of weeds and briars hindered me and cruelly tore my clothes, but I was none the less glad that they were there to give me concealment in case of peril. I knew that much of my route must be visible from the Rowley Road. The marshy region began very shortly, with a single track on a low, grassy embankment where the weedy growth was somewhat thinner. Then came a sort of island of higher ground, where the line passed through a shallow open cut choked with bushes and brambles. I was very glad of this partial shelter, since at this point the Rowley Road was uncomfortably near, according to my window view. At the end of the cut, it would cross the track and swerve off to a safer distance, but meanwhile I must be exceedingly careful. I was by this time thankfully certain that the railway itself was not patrolled. Just before entering the cut, I glanced behind me, but saw no pursuer. The ancient spires and roofs of decaying Innsmouth gleamed lovely and ethereal in the magic yellow moonlight, and I thought of how they must have looked in the old days before the shadow fell. Then, as my gaze circled inland from the town, something less tranquil arrested my notice and held me immobile for a second. What I saw, or fancied I saw, was a disturbing suggestion of undulant motion far to the south, a suggestion which made me conclude that a very large horde must be pouring out of the city along the level Ipswich Road. The distance was great, and I could distinguish nothing in detail, but I did not at all like the look of that moving column. It undulated too much, and glistened too brightly in the rays of the now westering moon. There was a suggestion of sound, too, though the wind was blowing the other way. A suggestion of bestial scraping and bellowing even worse than the muttering of the parties I had lately overheard. All sorts of unpleasant conjectures crossed my mind. I thought of those very extreme Innsmouth types said to be hidden in crumbling, centuried warrens near the waterfront. I thought too of those nameless swimmers I had seen. Counting the parties so far glimpsed, as well as those presumably covering other roads, the number of my pursuers must be strangely large for a town as depopulated as Innsmouth. Whence could come the dense personnel of such a column as I now beheld? Did those ancient, unplumbed warrens teem with a twisted, uncatalogued, and unsuspected life? Or had some unseen ship indeed landed a legion of unknown outsiders on that hellish reef? Who were they? Why were they here? And if such a column of them was scouring the Ipswich Road, would the patrols on the other roads be likewise augmented? I had entered the brush-grown cut, and was struggling along at a very slow pace, when that damnably fishy odor again waxed dominant. 
Had the wind suddenly changed eastward so that it blew in from the sea and over the town? It must have, I concluded, since I now began to hear shocking guttural murmurs from that hitherto silent direction. There was another sound, too, a kind of wholesale colossal flopping or pattering which somehow called up images of the most detestable sort. It made me think illogically of that unpleasantly undulating column on the far-off Ipswich Road. And then both stench and sounds grew stronger, so that I paused shivering and grateful for the cut's protection. It was here, I recalled, that the Rowley Road drew so close to the old railway before crossing westward and diverging. Something was coming along that road, and I must lie low till its passage and vanishment in the distance. Thank heaven these creatures employed no dogs for tracking, though perhaps that would have been impossible amidst the omnipresent regional odor. Crouched in the bushes of that sandy cleft, I felt reasonably safe, even though I knew the searchers would have to cross the track in front of me, not much more than a hundred yards away. I would be able to see them, but they could not, except by a malign miracle, see me. All at once I began dreading to look at them as they passed. I saw the close moonlit space where they would surge by, and had curious thoughts about the irredeemable pollution of that space. They would, perhaps, be the worst of all Innsmouth types, something one would not care to remember. All at once I began dreading to look at them as they passed. I saw the close moonlit space where they would surge by, and had curious thoughts about the irredeemable pollution of that space. They would, perhaps, be the worst of all Innsmouth types, something one would not care to remember. The stench waxed overpowering, and the noises swelled to a bestial babble of croaking, baying, and barking, without the least suggestion of human speech. Were these, indeed, the voices of my pursuers? Did they have dogs after all? So far I had seen none of the lower animals in Innsmouth. That flopping or pattering was monstrous. I could not look upon the degenerate creatures responsible for it. I would keep my eyes shut till the sounds receded towards the west. The horde was very close now, the air foul with their horse snarling, and the ground almost shaking with alien rhythm footfalls. My breath nearly ceased to come, and I put every ounce of willpower into the task of holding my eyelids down. I'm not even yet willing to say whether what followed was a hideous actuality, or only a nightmare hallucination. The latter action of the government after my frantic appeals, would tend to confirm it as a monstrous truth. But could not a hallucination have been repeated under the quasi-hypnotic spell of that ancient, haunted, and shadowed town? Such places have strange properties, and the legacy of insane legend might well have acted on more than one human imagination amidst those dead, stench-cursed streets, and huddles of rotting roofs and crumbling steeples. Is it not possible that the germ of an actual contagious madness lurks in the depths of that shadow over Innsmouth? Who can be sure of reality after hearing things like the tale of old Zadok Allen? The government men never found poor Zadok, and have no conjectures to make as to what became of him. Where does madness leave off and reality begin? Is it possible that even my lightest fear is sheer delusion? But I must try to tell what I thought I saw that night, under the mocking yellow moon, saw surging and hopping down the Rowley Road in plain sight in front of me as I crouched along the wild brambles of that desolate railway gut. Of course, my resolution to keep my eyes shut had failed. It was foredoomed to failure, for who could crouch blindly while a legion of croaking, baying entities of unknown source flopped noisomely past, scarcely more than a hundred yards away? I thought I was prepared for the worst, and I really ought to have been prepared considering what I had seen before. My other pursuers had been accursedly abnormal, so should I not have been ready to face a strengthening of the abnormal element, to look upon forms in which there was no mixture of the normal at all? I did not open my eyes until the raucous clamor came loudly from a point obviously straight ahead. Then I knew that a long section of them must be plainly in sight, where the sides of the cut flattened out and the road crossed the track. 
and I could no longer keep myself from sampling whatever horror that leering yellow moon might have to shew. It was the end, for whatever remains to me of life on the surface of this earth, of every vestige of mental peace and confidence in the integrity of nature and of the human mind, nothing that I could have imagined, nothing even that I could have gathered had I credited old Zadok's crazy tale in the most literal way, would be in any way comparable to the demoniac, blasphemous reality that I saw, or believe I saw. I have tried to hint what it was in order to postpone the horror of writing it down baldly. Can it be possible that this planet had actually spawned such things? That human eyes have truly seen as objective flesh what man has hitherto known only in febrile fantasy and tenuous legend? And yet I saw them in a limitless stream, flopping, hopping, croaking, bleating, surging inhumanely through the spectral moonlight in a grotesque, malignant saraband of fantastic nightmare. And some of them had tall tiaras, that nameless whitish gold metal, and some were strangely robed, and one who led the way was clad in a ghoulishly humped black coat and striped trousers, and had a men's felt hat perched on the shapeless thing that answered for a head. I think their predominant color was a grayish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their black backs were scaly. Their forms vaguely suggested the anthropoid, while their heads were the heads of fish, with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. And the sides of their necks were palpitating gills, and their long paws were webbed. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs and sometimes on four. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices, clearly used for articulate speech, held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. But for all their monstrousness, they were not unfamiliar to me. I knew too well what they must be, for was not the memory of that evil tiara at Newburyport still fresh? They were the blasphemous fish-frogs of the nameless design, living and horrible, and as I saw them I knew also of that humped tiarid priest in the black church basement had so fearsomely reminded me. Their number was past guessing. It seemed to me that there were limitless swarms of them, and certainly my momentary glimpse could have shown only the least fraction. In another instant everything was blotted out by a merciful fit of fainting. The first I had ever had. Chapter 5 It was a gentle daylight rain that awaked me from my stupor in the brush grown railway cut, and when I staggered out to the roadway ahead I saw no trace of any prints in the fresh mud. The fishy odor, too, was gone. Innsmouth's ruined roofs and toppling steeples loomed up grayly toward the southeast, but not a living creature did I spy in all the desolate salt marshes around. My watch was still going, and told me that the hour was past noon. The reality of what I had been through was highly uncertain in my mind, but I felt that something hideous lay in the background. I must get away from evil shadowed Innsmouth, and accordingly I began to test my cramped, wearied powers of locomotion. Despite weakness, hunger, horror, and bewilderment, I found myself, after a time, able to walk, so started slowly along the muddy road to Rowley. Before evening I was in the village, getting a meal and providing myself with presentable clothes. I caught the night train to Arkham, and the next day talked long and earnestly with government officials there, a process I later repeated in Boston. With the main result of these colloquies, the public is now familiar, and I wish, for normality's sake, there were nothing more to tell. Perhaps it is madness that has overtaken me, yet perhaps a greater horror or a greater marvel is reaching out. As may well be imagined, I gave up most of the foreplanned features of the rest of my tour, the scenic, architectural, and antiquarian diversions on which I had counted so heavily. Nor did I dare look for that piece of strange jewelry said to be in the Miskatonic University Museum. I did, however, improve my stay in Arkham by collecting some genealogical notes I had long wished to possess. 
very rough and hasty data, it is true, but capable of good use later on when I might have time to collate and codify them. The curator of the historical society there, Mr. E. Laugham Peabody, was very courteous about assisting me, and expressed unusual interest when I told him I was a grandson of Eliza Orne of Arkham, who was born in 1867 and had married James Williamson of Ohio at the age of 17. It seemed that a maternal uncle of mine had been there many years before on a quest much like my own, and that my grandmother's family was a topic of some local curiosity. And there had, Mr. Peabody said, been considerable discussion about the marriage of her father, Benjamin Orne, just after the Civil War, since the ancestry of the bride was peculiarly puzzling. That bride was understood to have been an orphaned Marsh of New Hampshire, a cousin of the Essex County Marshes, but her education had been in France, and she knew very little of her family. Her guardian had deposited funds in a Boston bank to maintain her and her French governess, but that guardian's name was unfamiliar to Arkham people, and in time he dropped out of sight, so the governess assumed his role by court appointment. The French woman, now long dead, was very taciturn, and there were those who said she could have told more than she did. But the most baffling thing was the inability of anyone to place the recorded parents of the young woman, Enoch and Lydia Meserve Marsh, among the known families of New Hampshire. Possibly, many suggested, she was a natural daughter of some Marsh of prominence. She certainly had the true Marsh eyes. Most of the puzzling was done after her early death which took place at the birth of my grandmother, her only child. Having formed some disagreeable impressions connected with the name of Marsh, I did not welcome the news that it belonged to my own ancestral tree, nor was I pleased by Mr. Peabody's suggestion that I had the true Marsh eyes myself. However, I was grateful for data which I knew would prove valuable, and took copious notes and lists of book references regarding the well-documented Orn family. I went directly home to Toledo from Boston, and later spent a month at Maumee, recuperating from my ordeal. In September I entered Oberlin for my final year, and from then till the next June was busy with studies and other wholesome activities, reminded of the bygone terror only by occasional official visits from government men in connection with the campaign which my pleas and evidence had started. Around the middle of July, just a year after the Innsmouth experience, I spent a week with my late mother's family in Cleveland, checking some of my due genealogical data with the various notes, traditions, and bits of heirloom material in existence there, and seeing what kind of a connected chart I could construct. I did not exactly relish this task, for the atmosphere of the Williamson home had always depressed me. There was a strain of morbidity there, and my mother had never encouraged my visiting her parents as a child, although she always welcomed her father when he came to Toledo. My Arca-born grandmother had seemed strange and almost terrifying to me, and I do not think I grieved when she disappeared. I was eight years old then, and it was said that she had wandered off in grief after the suicide of my Uncle Douglas, her eldest son. He had shot himself after a trip to New England, the same trip, no doubt, which had caused him to be recalled at the Arkham Historical Society. This uncle had resembled her, and I had never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them had given me a vague, unaccountable... Backing up just a bit. This uncle had resembled her, and I had never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them had given me a vague, unaccountable uneasiness. My mother and Uncle Walter had not looked like that. They were like their father, though poor little cousin Lawrence, Walter's son, had been an almost perfect duplicate of his grandmother before his condition took him to the permanent seclusion of a sanitarium at Canton. I had not seen him in four years, but my uncle once implied that his state, both mental and physical, was very bad. This worry had probably been a major cause of his mother's death two years before. My grandfather and his widowed son Walter now comprised the Cleveland household, but the memory of older times hung thickly over it. 
I still disliked the place and tried to get my researches done as quickly as possible. Williamson records and traditions were supplied in abundance by my grandfather, though for Orne material I had to depend on my Uncle Walter, who put at my disposal the contents of all his files, including notes, letters, cuttings, heirlooms, photographs, and miniatures. It was in going over the letters and pictures on the Orne side that I began to acquire a kind of terror of my own ancestry. As I have said, my grandmother and Uncle Douglas had always disturbed me. Now, years after their passing, I gazed at their pictured faces with a measurably heightened feeling of repulsion and alienation. I could not at first understand the change, but gradually a horrible sort of comparison began to obtrude itself on my unconscious mind, despite the steady refusal of my consciousness to admit even the least suspicion of it. It was clear that the typical expression of these faces now suggested something it had not suggested before, something which would bring stark panic if too openly thought of. But the worst shock came when my uncle shewed me the orange jewelry in a downtown safe deposit vault. Some of the items were delicate and inspiring enough, but there was one box of strange old pieces descended from my mysterious great-grandmother, which my uncle was almost reluctant to produce. They were, he said, a very grotesque and almost repulsive design, and had never to his knowledge been publicly worn, though my grandmother used to enjoy looking at them. Vague legends of bad luck clustered around them, and my great-grandmother's French governess had said they ought not to be worn in New England, though it would be quite safe to wear them in Europe. As my uncle began slowly and grudgingly to unwrap the things, he urged me not to be shocked by the strangeness and frequent hideousness of the designs. Artists and archaeologists who had seen them pronounced the workmanship superlatively and exotically exquisite, though no one seemed able to define their exact material or assign them to any specific art tradition. There were two armlets a tiara, and a kind of pectoral, the latter having in high relief certain figures of almost unbearable extravagance. During this description I had kept a tight rein on my emotions, but my face must have betrayed my mounting fears. My uncle looked concerned, and paused in his unwrapping to study my countenance. I motioned to him to continue, which he did with renewed signs of reluctance. He seemed to expect some demonstration when the first piece, the tiara, became visible, but I doubt if he expected quite what actually happened. I did not expect it either, for I thought I was thoroughly forewarned regarding what the jewelry would turn out to be. What I did was to faint silently away, just as I had done in that briar-choked railway cut a year before. From that day on, my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension nor do I know how much is hideous truth and how much madness. My great-grandmother had been a marsh of unknown source whose husband lived in Arkham, and did not old Zadok say that the daughter of Obed Marsh by a monstrous mother was married to an Arkham man through a trick? What was it the ancient toper had muttered about the likeness of my eyes to Captain Obed's? In Arkham, too, the curator had told me I had the true marsh eyes, was Obed Marsh my own great-great-grandfather? Who, or what, then, was my great-great-grandmother? But perhaps this was all madness. Those whitish gold ornaments might easily have been bought from some Innsmouth sailor by the father of my great-grandmother, whoever he was. And that look in the staring-eyed faces of my grandmother and self-slain uncle might be sheer fancy on my part. Sheer fancy bolstered up by the Innsmouth shadow which had so darkly colored my imagination. But why had my uncle unalived himself after an ancestral quest in New England? For more than two years I fought off these reflections with partial success. My father secured me a place in an insurance office, and I buried myself in routine as deeply as possible. In the winter of 1930 and 31, however, the dreams began... They were very sparse and insidious at first, but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great watery spaces opened out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean halls with grotesque fishes as my companions. Then the other shapes began to appear, 
filling me with nameless horror the moment I awoke. But during the dreams, they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them, wearing their unhuman trappings, treading their aqueous ways, and praying monstrously at their evil sea-bottom temples. There was much more than I could remember, but even what I did remember each morning would be enough to stamp me as a madman or a genius, if ever I dared write it down. Some frightful influence I felt was seeking gradually to drag me out of the sane world of wholesome life into unnameable abysses of blackness and alienage, and the process told heavily on me. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd nervous affliction had me in its grip, and I found myself at times almost unable to shut my eyes. It was then that I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began looking at me curiously and almost affrightedly. What was taking place in me? Could it be that I was coming to resemble my grandmother and Uncle Douglas? One night I had a frightful dream in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace of many terraces, with gardens of strange leprous corals and grotesque brachiate affluences, and welcomed me with such a warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed, as those who take to the water change, and told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead son had learned about, and had leaped to a realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm, too. I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. I met also that which had been her grandmother. For eighty thousand years, Pithithlia had lived in Yenathlne, and thither she had gone back after Obed Marsh was dead. Iathnathle was not destroyed when the upper earthmen shot death into the sea. It was hurt, but not destroyed. The Deep Ones could never be destroyed, even though the Paleogean magic of the forgotten Old Ones might sometimes check them. For the present, they would rest. But some day, if they remembered... They would rise again for the tribute Great Cthulhu craved. It would be a city greater than Innsmouth next time. They had planned to spread, and had brought up that which would help them. But now they must wait once more. For bringing the upper earth men's death, I must do a penance, but that would not be heavy. This was the dream in which I saw a Shoggoth for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning the mirror definitely told me I'd acquired the Innsmouth look. So far, I have not shot myself as my Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step, but certain dreams deterred me. The tense extremes of horror are lessening and I feel queerly drawn toward the unknown sea-deeps instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in sleep, and awake with a kind of exultation instead of terror. I do not believe I need to wait for the full change, as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium, as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard-of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. No, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from that Canton madhouse, and together we shall go to Marvel Shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out of that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopean and many-colored Iathnathle. And in that lair of the Deep Ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever. The End